In any life, we have highs and lows, light and dark, wins and losses. What happens when we encounter that moment in time when what happens next could change everything? Join us as we step into another person's inspirational moment and see how we can connect their experience to ours. This is Greg Stevens, and you're listening to A Shot of Inspiration. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of A Shot of Inspiration. I'm Greg Stevens, your host, and today we have a guest who's been on before, and I'm excited to reintroduce him. It's Mark Carpenter. Now, first time I talked with Mark, we were talking about his book, Master Storytelling, his training. I t- talk to people all the time about master storytelling, how they need to implement that into what they're doing in their managing and how they want to inspire people. But today, Mark has a new book, and I'm excited to have him on again to talk about the launch of it. And Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. As you said, I've been on the show before. It makes it sound like I'm a repeat offender. I'm mul- multiple convictions, and, and that's fine. I'm, I'm loving being convicted here with Greg Stevens. You're awesome. I'm so glad to have you here. So tell us the name of your book, and I've read through it. I haven't read it cover to cover yet, but I've probably got about three quarters of it done, but I haven't done it cover to cover. So tell us what's the name of your book and what inspired you to write it? The book is titled Lead Like a Person, Not Like a Position. And part of what inspired this, it really ties back to master storytelling. I talked to a lot of leaders about using storytelling to communicate really clearly with their people. And I had somebody push back on a little bit and says, so what? What's the big picture that we're looking at? And as I thought about it more, I thought what I'm really trying to get people to do is lead with greater humanity, to make connections with people in business as a leader. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, wow, we really don't teach new leaders to do that very well. We don't at all. Yeah, we set up new leaders for failure. I ask this question a lot of, of people. In fact, just play this through with me. Your listeners, are, I've got to know this is totally unrehearsed. Uh, so I'm setting Greg up here. But if I was to ask you, who gets promoted to lead a team when they knew, need a new leader? Who gets promoted into that first-time leader position? So for like sales, it'd be top salesperson. There you go. Who, who's best at that job. Yeah, very typically I get the the best performer on the team or the person who's been there the longest. Yeah. And sometimes that's the same person, sometimes it's not, but those are the usually the the responses that I get. Now, does being the best performer, either as a sales professional, as a software developer, as a marketing assistant, whatever it happens to be, does that qualify you to lead people? Not at all. And I don't want to be unkind because for some people, maybe it is. Maybe they have developed those skills along the way. But for most people, they have good position skills. Right. They don't have people skills. And when you get put into a new leadership position, your job is now to get work done through other people. Previously, your job has been to get work done through yourself. Right. Right. Primarily. It's do your job, do your own work. Certainly you're collaborating with other people, but now you are responsible for other people getting work done. Now, let me go back to that scenario. You put this top performer into their first time leadership position. And what type of training do we give to that first time leader? Onboarding, how to hire and fire, what to do legally, the bare bones that you have to do and uh, to not screw up and get the company sued. Well said and getting right to the heart of the matter on that. It's really interesting as I've asked people that question, what kind of training do we give that person? My most common response that I get from people is nothing. Yeah. But, but the, the reality is exactly what you're talking about. You typically train them on processes, systems, policies, you know, reports we need you to do. Reports, meetings yeah. you need to be in. Right. Maybe we give them some budgeting background. We give them more position skills. And things not to say to people. We don't yeah. teach them how to say things. Yeah. And, and it, that is really interesting. There's a lot of what not to do mm-hmm. when, you're, when, when it comes to the people part of it. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. 
But what do we not give those people? We don't give them training on people skills. How do you actually work effectively with people? And so we set up these first time leaders basically for struggles, for failures. And then, and sometimes it, it, it's okay. It, 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 things go fine, usually until a situation gets tough, till the economy gets tough or there's a problem, there's a project that's running behind. There's some situation that kind of heightens it. There's a great quote that I rely on all the time from a, an ancient Greek poet named Archilochus. He said, we do not rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. Yeah. We do not rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. And so if we've only trained people on position skills, what are they going to fall on when times get tough? The position skills. Exactly. They're going to start leading from their position. They're going to start leading with authority. They're going to start going into, okay, what can't I say here? What can't I say here? And not thinking about what should I say here? How do I help my team? And that's when you get leaders who say things like, just do it because I told you so. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I'm the boss now. Just do what I say. Or we have to because management says so. Or they disappear. They lock themselves in their office or they don't, or they aren't available for people because they don't know how to manage those tough people situations. Right. So true. So true. Yeah. As I've worked in the same industry as you for years and coaching different you know, people from frontline managers to middle to upper directors and above at executive teams, it's interesting to watch how career, careers have uh, moved. And usually people want to be there no more than two years. They want to move on. So often the real learning about how to engage with people happens after that. And so I moved to a different place that we teach getting things done. I love that. It's a process. These are the things you do to get things done. And you can quickly get a, a team maybe aligned for a short amount of time, but then, okay, I'm going to go somewhere else. And they get moved up each time. Many times as I've worked with many executives, they haven't even had the, the level of training required to be the type of leader that organization needs many times. And then that's where the shame and blame come on. That's where a lot of control comes. And there are great leaders out there that have learned along the way. But what I typically find, those people took real time to focus on their own development rather than whatever was required for the next phase, and then having a good team behind them. Maybe sometimes they inherited a good team and then they got moved up again, but they're at a level and then they don't have the skill. And that's one of the hardest things I find for executives. My heart goes out to them because everyone's watching and, and I don't have the skills that some of these others do, but I'm not going to show it because then I would look, I don't want to worry about how I'm looking right now. And that's the biggest fear I run into when I work with some executive team. Your, your point is spot on, Greg. And that really is the point of lead like a person, not like a position, is that we aren't intentional about developing those skills. You get some great people leaders. And, and, and a lot of times we look at them like it's this big mystery. Wow, how did they become that? How did they do that? But, but it, it really is they've learned skills over a period of time. There, there's a, a great little piece of data that, that, I, that I pulled off of, of LinkedIn from a company called Zinger Folkman, who, who's also a, a leadership training and development company. And they asked the people that are attending their leadership development courses, at what age were you first made a people leader? And the average age was 29. Wow. So fairly young, yeah. fairly young people became people leaders. And then they asked them, at what age... Did you first get training on leading people? You want to cool. guess at what the age was? I'll give you a hint. It's higher than 29. <laughs> what is it? 46. 46. So oh, look at the gap. 17 years. Yeah. 17 years. There's this huge gap yeah. between when we expect people to lead and we actually train them on how to lead. Yeah. And specifically around how to lead people. 
And if you look at what people want from their leaders, what do, what do people want most from their direct manager, from their direct leaders? What it, 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 any guesses what in, in your experiences in, in, in working with all these different well, organizations? Most people want to learn how to deal with people. That's what I would good. think because that's, that's what they're most uncomfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm talking specifically about what do the individual contributors want from their leader? Oh, I think, wouldn't you say feedback, direction? There you yeah. go. Yeah. They, they want feedback. They want development in their career. They want a relationship where they can be open and upfront with each other. Okay. Now, take those desires, those needs of the team, and then let's go back to the list of the skills that we give first-time leaders. Right. They about don't. process, policy, what not to say, the, the point that you brought up. We're not giving them the skills to help deliver to what the, the team wants. And then we wonder why those first-time leaders aren't successful. Yeah. We wonder why they struggle. It's interesting, yeah, as you were saying this, it reminded me of several years ago, I was working with the executive team of an energy company and huge company. And as I was working with the team, the CFO, the entire organization, he'd been there 22 years. He said, where were you 20 years ago? He said, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known this one thing. It was just one of many he had learned. He said, this one idea would have helped me so much. And he said, I, I would have probably knocked out 50% of the problems I had. And he, he said, it all stemmed from that. And he goes, I didn't know. Yeah. You can just tell he had a relief, but a missing. It's like, why did I have to do that this long? So he said, I'm about to retire. <laughs> yeah. Also, and how many times have you done that? Because I've done it in my career too. Absolutely. Where I thought, oh, if I'd only known this, I, would, I could have avoided some of these problems. And honestly, that's part of my motivation around writing, lead like a person, not like a position. I look back at times when I was early in my career and in some early leadership positions and the mistakes that I made and the regrets that I still have from making those mistakes. I want to help people to not have those same kind of regrets as they develop other people. I want them to be able to look back and say, I was the type of leader that I really wanted to be. This is who I wanted to be as a person and to be more intentional about that kind of leadership development. Awesome. Let me ask you, what are some of the keys to leading like a person? Let's talk about what can I look for if someone hasn't read the book or uh, get, their, uh, get them thinking about it because I want to see what's in here that I can actually say can I, I can actually use. It's, it's funny, Greg, as we were talking, I, I was thinking we've spent all the time talking about the problem and not about the solution. So I appreciate you moving us toward. So what is the solution to this problem? And a lot of times the pushback that I get from senior leaders is, yeah, but we don't have time and resources to spend all this money developing these brand new leaders. We can't pull them away from the work that they're trying to do. And so I propose three simple skill areas to focus on with new leaders, first time people leaders. Number one, listen intently. If we listen as leaders, we learn a lot. There's a tendency for new leaders to get into a position and go, I'm the boss now. I get to be telling people what to do. And we get into this tell people mode. Yeah. But if we listen more, we're going to learn a lot and we're going to be able to find out what the problem really is. If we're not listening, we're coming up with brilliant solutions to the wrong problem. So let's look at the listening first. Let's just talk about that for a second. It's interesting because I was just writing something recently and Someone told me, I'm a really good listener. You don't get to say whether you're a good listener. <laughs> if you want to find out if you're a good listener, feedback are you getting? We listen so little that when someone really does listen, you're getting, wow, thank you for listening. Or uh, that really made a difference in how, how you were listening to me. They point it out. But if they're not pointing it out to you and you're saying it, one of the things I found, a good listener doesn't have to tell people they're a good listener. Somebody it's, who says, I'm a good listener, that's equivalent to the person saying, I'm a really humble person. If you have to brag about your humility, you're probably not very humble. This is why I refer to it as listening intently. Mm -hmm. Because we listen casually most of the time. And yeah. most of the time, that's okay. 
But as a leader, there are times, especially when times are tough, that you need to listen more intently. And part of the challenge, I bring this out in the book, I tap into the, to the research of Oscar Tromboli, who's written a, a great book about how to listen. That there's some physiological challenges that come with us listening intently. Uh, the research that, that Oscar Tromboli has says that English speakers speak on average about 125 words per minute, but we can listen on average at about 400 words per minute. I am betting that there are some listeners to this podcast that are listening to it at one and a half or two times speed. And they're fine. They're keeping up just fine because I can't talk as fast as you can listen. But then take one more step. We can think at about 900 words per minute. Wow, I didn't know that. And think about the challenges that creates both on the listening side and on the speaking side. Because as I'm speaking, if I'm thinking at 900 words per minute and I'm speaking at 125 words per minute, that means I'm only getting out about 14% of the thoughts that are in my head. Now, as a leader, you have to recognize that when people are talking to you. They probably have a lot more thoughts than they're able to get out. So you got to slow it down, listen more intently to really find out what's going on. Yeah. Also, I think in the listeners running through their head, all the thoughts that are going, and that's one of the things with listening, it's the intentional listening says, I'm thinking about these things. I'm going to stop thinking yes. about these things and I'm going to slow down and get present with those 120 words a minute rather than in my head about it, making judgments and decisions and then jumping to conclusions where it's my turn to speak. Yeah, right on. That's, a, that's exactly what the challenge is. And that's exactly what I mean by listening intently yeah. Yeah. is that we, awesome. as we slow it down, we're very intentional about taking that time to listen to what people are saying, especially in cr critical moments. Okay. Well, that's the first one. You said there were three. What's the, what are the other two? Number two, communicate intentionally. And okay. I very purposely put them in that order because I, I think that the listening has to come first. Yeah, I agree. And communicating intentionally is taking it beyond, let me just tell you what to do. It's getting into why are we doing it? This ties back into my previous work in master storytelling, that people need to understand the why as well as the what. And sharing stories about what our mission is, what our vision is, why we want to follow this process or policy, that helps people understand that why beyond just do it because I said so. And it's also going to break down the kind of resistance that you get from position leadership, the authoritative do it because I said so. That breeds resistance. But if you help people see, this is what we need to do. Here's why we need to do it. Let me show you the benefit for you by explaining this it, it, with an example. That breaks down that resistance so that people are more willing to listen and to follow through on what you're saying. What I, what I get when you say that is you're building that bridge for their understanding and they can see why the construction is. But if you don't give that why, it's okay, I get from here to there. Yeah. You know, but okay, the bridge, this is why we're doing this. We got to get from here to here. I know the work I need to do. So that's the second one. What's the third? And, and uh, let me make one more comment on that oh, yeah, because please. I love that image of the bridge because I, I, you and I are both visual learners. We've had yeah. that discussion before. I, I think of that chasm between what the leader wants people to do and what they're seeing that they should do. And very often, if we're leading like a position, we're like lobbing grenades across the chasm to say, here, catch this, do this. And communicating <laughs> intentionally is building that bridge to say, let's meet in the middle here, or let me come over to your side, or you come over to my side so that we're working together on this. Yes, that's what I mean by communicating intentionally. And the third one is recognizing individually. So oh, listen intently, that. communicate intentionally, recognize individually. I'll go back to the examples you gave of what kind of uh, training we give first-time leaders. And a lot of times in there is, here's how to discipline people. Here's how to hold people accountable for what they do wrong. Here's what to do in these negative situations. What we don't tell people is, how do you recognize the good work that people are doing? Because actually, if you're on my team, Greg, and I come to you and say, Greg, I really love the way that you asked that question in this podcast. 
that question was just a spark for a great conversation. Thank you for doing that. That's helping us meet our mission. That's helping us meet our goals. You are going to very intentionally focus on that behavior and do it again. I have just increased accountability, helping recognize the positive that you're doing. We tend to get focused so much on the negative side. On the, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. You've got to change. What we don't focus on is what are you doing right? And let's build that. Because then you'll get people more frequently doing the right behaviors. I remember that old cartoon that says beating will continue until morale increases or something. And that, I, I know I've butchered it, but that's the idea. Most people yeah. like, do, do this, do this. And it brings with it short-term results and long-term profit. Yeah, And as I see that, one of the things I typically say in my class is how many of you go home at the end of the day going, wow, I just had too much acknowledgement today. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it just hit me so much. And everyone starts laughing. And then I talk about acknowledgement, how important it is in a structure to give that in. But what I typically get, especially the higher I go, people say, you want me to acknowledge them for doing their job? Yeah. And I'm like. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't have to. I'm paying them to do it. I go, yeah, and they could do it somewhere else. They could do yeah. it. But better for someone else if they're treated better. And it costs you nothing but paying attention and giving that, you know what? Thank you for doing that here. And there's a whole acknowledgement process I walk people through. But most people, are, uh, well, you know, if you do that, people start to take advantage of you if you do it too much. And then I, I stop, I say, a moment ago, everyone laughed when I said, how many of you get too much? Of oh, you're not getting enough. When yeah. that day comes and you say, people are taking advantage of you because you get too much acknowledgement, come talk to me then. Yeah. 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 Come, come see me or, or give me some specific examples of that because I've never seen it either. Yeah. And it's interesting. The, the other pushback that's similar to that that I get is, but if I start praising people for what they do, they're going to expect it all the time. Guess what? They already expect it all the time. Very true. There, there's research that yeah. shows that people expect that they will get acknowledged for their good work three times a month. Not very often. That's really not very often. Right. That you, you can look at that as once a week, acknowledging something that someone has done. They also report those people who expect to get it about three times a month. They, we ask them, how often do you get that kind of acknowledgement? And they said, about three times a year. So the expectation is already there. Wow. So if you're saying, I don't want to acknowledge people because they'll start expecting it, they already expect it. So it that's it, it, not going to change anything. And, it, and there's no research that shows that when you acknowledge people, they expect it more. They, their base level of how much they expect stays about the same. Yeah. It's interesting because you said that I have finished uh, my file out on the book. I might use this conversation in it because... One of the things I talked about in there, think about a child when they're at the swimming pool, they're up on the diving board, mommy, daddy, look at me. That's an eight in all of us. We want to be noticed and it's something we all have, but we rarely discuss. Yeah. And that is the essence of leading like a person it is seeing people as people. An example that I share in the book, when my son, Brian was in second grade, we went to his parent teacher conference and his teacher was praising him for helping other students when he gets done with assignments early in class. You think about this, second grade boys, what do they typically do when they get done early? They pester other people. They make it hard for other people to get things done. They make noise, they create problems. And so I thought, this is a behavior I want to reinforce. And so that night at home, I said to Brian, hey, your teacher said something really cool. I thought this was great. She said that you help other students when you're done with your assignments early. And she really appreciates how much that helps her and how much it helps the other students in the class. Thank you for doing that. Now, I want you to remember what I just said, because Brian's response surprised me. He walked over to me. He put his arms around me and he said, I love you too, dad. Oh, oh wow. Oh, wow. Now think about it. Did I stay Pink. in my compliment to Brian? I love you. No, but what did he hear? He heard, I am valued 
as a person. I am seen. Now, I always like to give the caveat. I am not telling that story in any way, shape, or form to suggest that you want the people who work for you to hug you and say, I love it. <laughs> that's, that's my HR disclaimer in there. Right. But don't you want the people who work for you to feel valued as human beings? Because if they do, what level of effort are they going to give to you? I love that. They're going to give you their best if they feel seen and valued as people. And that's what listening intently, communicate intentionally, and recognizing individually will do. I do want to ask you one thing. I love that. And you said something so can go, what is the difference on this conversation between acknowledgments and a compliment? Yeah, compliments are sometimes more surface level. And so the acknowledgement is specifically to a behavior. So a compliment is, Greg, I love that background you have there in your office. Yeah. That's, that, that's a nice compliment. Uh, right. And you can feel good about that. But it's about but something that, else. But that's different than me saying, Greg, I really loved that chapter in your book because it brought out these key points that have helped me and have helped other people. Right. And is an acknowledgement of effort that you've put in, of something that you've done. So I look at recognizing really around behaviors. What are the behaviors that you want to reinforce so that people will continue to do those behaviors? Thanks for that clarification, because as we're talking about this, I love that the connection that had for your son. And that's what I think your whole book is really about. When I read it, it's about connecting. You're a human, I'm a human. Anything else is a separation. Yeah. We can do so much more together when there's a connection. I'll go that extra mile for you if I'm connected with you. If yeah. I'm not connected with you, I'm going to do the bare minimum. Yeah. And there is research that will show that people leave their leaders. As much as they leave their companies, they're leaving their leaders. And typically, they're leaving leaders who are leading like a position. But when you get leaders who lead like a person, you're going to get lower turnover. You're going to get higher productivity. You're going to get better morale. And you're going to get better outcomes. Just better outcomes in terms of quality, on-time delivery, all, all of those aspects. And because you spend so much time at work, is it, wouldn't it be great to enjoy the relationships you do have at work? And I do believe as people are managed, that depends a lot. Sometimes if you have a good manager, you have people flourishing when you have a bad manager, you have a toxicity that comes with it because people don't know how to express. So they complain to each other and it rottens, it creates a culture of rottenness, in, in my opinion, and a place where I don't want to go in the mornings when I have to go to work rather than, yeah. wow, what do I get to do? I, I typically ask people on your first day of work, remember what it's like. Think about it. Yeah, at the, at the job you're in, it doesn't matter when it is. You're excited. Why? Because it's new. You don't know what's ahead, but you're thinking in possible possibilities. What could this be? And then what happens is we get hurt over and we start to close ourselves up. It's like the same old job. This is just how life is. And we acquiesce rather than taking responsibility. And I love that's what your book does. It says, this is the responsible way to manage rather than the easy way. And, and let me take what you just said and, and put it not to the individual team members, but to the leader side. When you're leading like a position, those are the nights that you go home and go, do I even want to do this? This is a bad day. This is, I got this discord on my team that doesn't feel good because that's not who we want to be in our core as people. When you lead like a person, you come home at the end of the day going, I did my best. I helped people. I listened. I communicated. I acknowledged people's good work. I did these people skills so that we have the connection. So the connection is not just there with the team member. It's there with the leader too. And you feel more successful because you're being the leader that you really want to be. And I love that because no matter where you are, you're a... Uh, 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 uh exceptional leader or a poor leader, you're still going 
to face trials. You're still going to have problems. There's no difference. The one is how you engage with them with your team. Absolutely. I was just having a conversation last week with a, an organization that market conditions have required that they're going through some downsizing. And they went through our lead like a person training for their leaders. And they are finding it so helpful that it's not just a, hey, sorry, you're laid off, but it's, hey, let me explain why this is happening. And let me give my personal connection on this. And how can we help you going forward from this? It changes the leader's outlook because they're not just checking a box. They're actually thinking about the people. And then the people who are left are feeling more seen and heard rather than looking over their shoulders all the time, wondering, am I the next one? And so it just changes the environment at work when you've got leaders who lead with humanity. Mark, thank you for writing this book. Can you tell people how to get it and also how to reach out for you for the training or uh, also let them know about Master Storytelling? I want to, you, people to be able to reach out to you, easily get in touch with you. Awesome. We have the, the website leadlikeaperson.com. Just run all those together, leadlikeaperson.com, and that will give you more information on the workshop, a little more background on the book and how that came about. We have a contact us uh, a site on that page. You can connect with me there. I would love to work with your leadership teams in, in developing some of these skills. The master storytelling site is master-storytelling.com. So there's a little dash between those two. And you can always connect with me on LinkedIn. So Mark Carpenter, and I'm based in Sandy, Utah. So look for uh, Mark Carpenter. And if you're on the video side of this face, there's a lot of Mark Carpenters out there. There's only one that has my face. And uh, I'd love to connect with you and, and see how we can help build a world where we're leading with greater humanity. And, and that's not about being soft. It's not about, oh, let's just all have nirvana at work. There's going to be <laughs> tough times, like you said earlier. But there's so many positive benefits from a financial side and from a production side of leading with greater humanity. And that's my mission. That's my goal is to help us connect more as people, even when we're doing the tough work. Mark, thank you so much for your integrity and for your generous gift, putting it out there. And I support you. Everyone, please reach out to Mark if you feel led. And uh, thank you for listening to another episode of A Shot of Inspiration. I'm Greg Stevens. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of A Shot of Inspiration. If you like this or any of our other episodes, make sure you rate it and share it with a friend. This is Greg Stevens, and we look forward to being with you next time. Until then, be bold, be courageous, and respectfully speak your truth.